Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Lacey. I am a senior solution architect specializing in, uh, in Microsoft and Windows services for AWS. I uh, appreciate everybody being here late on a Thursday afternoon. I'm sure it's been a long week, so I really didn't expect as many people, so it's great to see everybody here. It's awesome. Um, just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been with AWS for uh, almost a year. Uh, was at Microsoft for a long time prior to that, so um, just wanted a quick show of hands. How many of you are currently Office 365 users? Okay. Get a, get a smaller show of hands. How many are thinking about being Office 365 users? Okay, kind of expected that. Awesome. Um, so if you expected to show up here and me bash Office 365, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I, I was an exchange manager for a long time um, when I was uh, at Microsoft helped roll out a product there called BPAWS. If anybody's familiar with it, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Luckily, it was one service that we failed fast there um, and came out with Office 365, which I'm a big fan of. Um, but part of this talk, what we're gonna talk about today is, is um, helping overcome some, some common issues and themes that we see some customers run into um, in ways that, that maybe AWS can help you out with and can give you some, some ideas. Uh, so one of them being around security um, and specifically Active Directory integration, um, which if you, if you haven't rolled out Office 365, the four or five of you who said that, uh, this is going to be a major implementation stepping stone for you. Those of you who have done Office 365 implementations, you know what I mean. Um, and and it, not that this won't be irrelevant to you, but maybe we can help you clean up some of the AD, ADFS, AD sync stuff that you have going on um, and, and, and reduce some of that infrastructure. We'll talk about some, some customizations, uh, specifically SharePoint. We see this as a pain point for, um, a lot of customers I've worked with see SharePoint as a pain point with Office 365 and having a tough time getting SharePoint into Office 365. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about um, control uh, and location of the data and, and, uh, and safeguarding some of that data. So with that, we'll talk about, we'll start off with, uh, with Active Directory first. Um, and so as most of you know, if you've done your Office 365 implementation already, you know the first big step is setting up ADFS and AD Sync and synchronizing all your users from on-prem to, to Azure AD. Um, and depending on the size of your organization, that's a lot of additional infrastructure that you had to put in place when you thought you were moving to the cloud and you were gonna reduce infrastructure. It seemed a little, little, little backwards in the beginning. Um, so if you haven't been watching our blog, we had a blog post that came out a little over a month ago uh, where we're supporting um, ADFS on our managed AD. Um, so if you already have an on-premise AD, uh, one of the things that we see moving, people moving into AWS doing is setting up uh, a managed Active Directory in the cloud. Um, and we're seeing some customers who are leveraging that to then jump over to Azure AD so they don't have to open up all the ports and firewalls on their own infrastructure. They can leverage AWS to do that. Um, so I, I just want to spend a little bit of time walking through that. It's, it's pretty much straightforward like a regular ADFS uh, and AD sync implementation, but in managed AD, you don't have domain and enterprise uh, admin rights. So there's a little bit of a work that you need to do to get ADFS installed, and so we'll talk about that. Um, but let me walk you through, for those of you who haven't done this implementation, uh, what needs to happen to get ADFS working with, with Office 365 and Azure AD. Um, and in this implementation, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is, uh, is provision your AWS Microsoft AD which is really like three or four clicks in on the console, you go to directory service, you pick um, the AWS Microsoft AD, give it a domain name, it provisions the domain controller for you. It's a managed service, so if you're not familiar with it, what we mean by managed is you're getting a, a full Windows 2012 R2 instance, you're not in a multi-tenant environment, it's yours. We just back it up for you, we patch it for you, we maintain it. If something goes down with the hardware, we bring up another one for you. So we, you get out of the uh, underlying infrastructure and hardware of managing that, that instance, um, and you can just focus on uh, managing Active Directory itself. 
So you're going to want to provision that first. Then you'll want to provision three servers, um, three EC2 domain join servers. You'll domain join them to this new uh, AWS Microsoft AD. Uh, the, first, the first one you're going to provision is a management server that you'll install the AD administration tools on. Uh, then you'll install and domain join the ADFS server, or a server that will become the ADFS server. Uh, and then the third one is a server that will run the AD sync tools. Um, and then from the management server, once it's up and running, you create your ADFS service account, which is that um, step six you see there. Obviously, you also have to also provision an Office 365 and an Azure AD tenant with Microsoft, okay? Now, this is, this is the part that I really want to kind of focus in on a little bit. Um, from here, ADFS and a default install of ADFS uh, is looking to install into two OUs that you, don't, you won't necessarily have available in a managed AD. So we have to do a little bit of a trick to get it in there and teach uh, the Microsoft ADFS install on what they are. And so what we have to do is create uh, two new containers. And there's a little bit of PowerShell work we have to do here to get this up and running. Uh, the first PowerShell step is to create a new GUID. Um, so there's a PowerShell script here of uh, new GUID.GUID, um, and it'll create the big long string. You're going to want to copy that and save that because we're going to reference it again in just a moment. The next step is to create a new uh, OU container. So the next PowerShell strip is, is uh, it'll create a new AD object, uh, and the name is ADFS. And then we'll create another one using the name of that GUID that we, that we created in the first step. Okay, so when you get done with this, what you should have in, in, uh, in your Active Directory users and computers is two new folders, ADFS, and then another folder underneath it that has the big long GUID, okay? Once this is done, you can continue with the rest of the ADFS install, getting the certificate, setting up the service, and you'll eventually get to a point where you'll run another PowerShell script to actually install and invoke ADFS, and you'll tell it to install to this OU, okay, that you just created. Um, and from there, the rest of the provisioning is exactly the same. Now, I know I went through all this really, really quickly. Um, luckily, we have... A, a blog post on it. Um, this blog post will walk you step by step with exactly what I just talked you, walked you through um, with all, all the beautiful colored detail that I just went through. Um, but it'll get it all set up for you and you'll, and, and all the way into um, replicating your users into uh, Azure AD. Um, but I wanted to point out those, those PowerShell scripts because that's the one step that's a little different from a normal ADFS uh, install. The good thing is once you're done with this, you're, you're set up to do any other kind of SAML federation that you want to. So it's usable beyond just synchronizing Wealth Office 365 and Azure AD. Um, so if you're looking to do any kind of SAML authentication with any other provider, um, this is a great step to go ahead and walk through as well. It'll get you a little bit farther down the road. Yep, so then once you've done, once you've done that, then you can start uh, replicating your users over to Office 365. Wanted to pause here real quick, because I know I ran through that really quickly. Any questions on that? Um, I, I wanted to point it out, because this is relatively new, and it's a great way, like I said, to get rid of a lot of uh, AD sync and ADFS infrastructure you may be running on-prem today, um, which is kind of a lot of hardware just sitting there replicating. Yes, sir? Okay, so the question was, with the managed AD, what happens to the on-premise and can it run in hybrid? Absolutely, so if you wanted to do that, a um, couple different things. The one we see most users or most companies doing is uh, setting up a one-way trust from the managed AB back to on-prem. You don't need a two-way trust. Some people do that for particular reasons, but most just opt for a one-way trust because all you need to do is 
Um, the servers that you're going to domain join in AWS just need to be able to trust the credentials that are coming from on-prem and not the other way around. Um, sometimes you may want to. Usually that will pass most security-minded security folks who start talking about trust to the cloud get very, very nervous. Um, and so when I point out that it's just a one-way trust and you're not trusting the cloud, you're telling the cloud to trust you, okay, they, they feel a little, little more comfortable, right? I don't know if security people are ever completely comfortable with the cloud yet, but we're working on that. Yes, sir? That's right. That's right. Yeah, so that gets you any, any uh, uh, server that you provision inside of AWS uh, that's domain joined to that AWS Microsoft AD, um, you'd be able to use on-premise credentials to authenticate to those as well. That's right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So how does it work with this? Like when we have anything in AWS, can it push the users still on prem? So if I understand your question correct, you're you're provisioning users on prem to your on prem AD. That's replicating up to Azure AD. Yes, AD. Yep. So are you provisioning them a mailbox on prem or are you provisioning them an Office three sixty five mailbox? Okay. So this would be exactly the same, because what's happening with your on-prem, you're provisioning a user, um, and it's going to synchronize it up to uh, Azure AD, right? What I'm walking you through is if you wanted to eventually decommission your on-premise AD, and you had, uh, had your users up in Office 365, or in, in AWS, rather. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we're, we have a lot of customers who are trying to decommission stuff that's on-prem, so this is a stepping stone to get you from on-prem into AWS and then over to Azure AD. Right now we don't use ADFS, so do we have to use ADFS in Are you just doing the AD sync? Yeah. No, you don't have to. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. I'll move over to our next topic about SharePoint. Um, so the one the reason I want to bring about SharePoint we often see a lot of companies who have been longtime SharePoint users done a lot of customizations. Um, and because of the customizations or SharePoint applications that they're running, um, they're not able to move it over to AWR to Office 365 because it's not it's because the the extensions that they're running aren't supported or the application that they are running in SharePoint can't get there, right? And so you're kind of left in this limbo of, well, I thought I was going to the cloud and now I can't. Um, and so we like to talk about um, uh, one of our customers, Dole, who did this. Um, and in the first year, saved $350,000 in moving their SharePoint infrastructure over to, um, over to AWS. Um, and I wanted to sh show you a little bit about what they did, why they did it, and how they did it, um, and why they chose it over move moving it to Azure. Um, this may not be the first time you've seen this architecture. We do have a quick start that builds all this out for you. Um, but when you talk about SharePoint, the fun thing that's fun to talk about SharePoint is you're really talking about a three-tier web app, right? You've got a web front end, a middle tier, and a SQL back end um, that happens to leverage Active Directory. And so this quick start builds all this out for you. But the one thing that's really compelling about running it in AWS is the concept of availability zones with the SQL Server in the back end. And so if you're unfamiliar with availability zones, I'm sure most here are, um, it's not something new, but our availability zones are discrete, discrete data centers that are far enough away that they're on separate floodplains, they're in separate energy or electric grids. Um, so you know, if a tornado came and wiped one of them out, the other one's still up and running but they're still close enough where they have single-digit millisecond latency between the two. And the reason that's important when you're dealing with SQL Server is that means I can do synchronous replication of that SQL Server, okay? So I have not only HA, but DR inside a region. And when you're dealing with SharePoint, especially if you have an extensive SharePoint farm that you've been running for a long time, you've probably got a lot of data there. 
um, a lot of documents, a lot of uh, site collections. People have been using SharePoint for a long, long time. And so it's probably not tier one data, but it's one of those things that if it gets turned off, people start complaining pretty quickly. Um, and so being able to protect that SQL database and running it uh, in an HA and DR manner um, is really, really effective. And that's uh, one of the big reasons why Dole uh, chose to leverage AWS to run their SharePoint farm. Um, that $350,000 savings was just in one year, and they have since continued to expand and roll out more and more. Um, so yeah, really, really compelling way. And like I said, if you, if, if you wanna give it a shot, we do have a quick start. You can run the CloudFormation templates. It'll build out all of this. The, the internet gateways, the elastic load balancers, the Active Directory domain controllers, um, everything for you and have you up and running on SharePoint 2016 pretty quickly. Any questions about that? Okay. So the last point I wanna talk about, and we'll spend uh, some more time here, is safeguarding the data. Um, so when you've moved all of your data to Office 365, and most of you have, um, one of the things that you obviously have given up is control over that data. Um, you've kind of bought into some of the promises that Microsoft has given you that we're gonna maintain it and we're gonna run it and we have multiple replications of your data moving all around. And that's completely true, they do. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're completely safe from your data disappearing. Um, and so one of the things we wanna say is don't assume that your data is completely safe. Um, there's no backups of that data for instant recovery should something happen. Um, you know, users can still delete stuff from there that may not have been deleted um, and getting it back is not really out, straight out of natively out of Office 365 an easy way to do that. Um, and then some concerns around uh, data security. Um, we see a lot of data loss in Office 365 from a couple issues, the biggest one being synchronization issues. Uh, users purging their own data, like I said, they're deleting stuff that they didn't mean to delete and it's you know, then gone. Um, some ransomware where people are hijacking their data, um, insider threat and rogue administrators, you know, these, these are things that can happen that you know, just out of the box, Office 365 is not gonna protect you from. So it's something that you need to start thinking about if you haven't already. Um, and if any of you work with, or if you are security officers, the thing that keeps them awake at night is security. Like how am I making sure that all my data is secure? And, and if, if we're honest with ourselves, Exchange itself holds a lot of really important data. Um, you know, many, many companies use it as the greatest file server in the world, um, even though that's not what it was intended to be, right? Um, so, and kind of making the point that I made a little earlier, you know, with, with Microsoft Office 365, it's, it's a shared responsibility, you know. It's still your data. You still own the rights to it, but you also have to make sure that it's getting backed up somehow, um, and should, should, it, should it vanish. Um, that you're able to, to take care of that. So just making the point that you know, your data is not completely protected. Um, it's straight out of the box from Office 365. It's really difficult to do a mailbox or SharePoint site restore should something happen to it. Um, uh, if you're using OneDrive, re recovering those files, um, recovering data, where it was when it, when it got lost, or even restoring individual emails or calendars or files. Um, and so I wanna spend a little time talking about uh, one of our partners who's done, a, uh, I think, a fantastic job of, of solving this problem, and it's from NetApp. They have a service called Cloud Control that answers these problems. It gives you not only full mailbox restore or site recovery, or OneDrive re restore, but you can restore individual files or individual emails, um, individual calendar tasks, um, 
straight from, from their application. Um, and I'm going to show you cloud control. There are several other companies out there that do something similar, so I don't want to say that NetApp's the only one that's doing this. It's the one I'm most familiar with, um, so it's the reason why I picked it to show off. Um, but I want to do a little bit of a demo so you can kind of see that the user interface is actually really pretty straightforward and simple um, while still being very powerful. So this is my Office 365 implementation. Um, these are my users. Uh, these are my mailboxes um, in my admin center, right? Um, so if you're Office 365 admins, hopefully this isn't foreign to you. This, this looks very, very familiar. Um, and so from here, to get started with NetApp, one of the things you're going to go to is in your Exchange Admin Control, go into your permissions. Well, actually, I should just jump back. One of the first steps you want to create is a service account. So you'll see I have the CC Admin. That's my Cloud Control Admin account. Um, doesn't take up one of your Office 365 licenses because I'm not going to give it an email or anything. It's just, it's just an unlicensed user. It's a Azure AD user that you're creating, right? Once you create that user, go into admin control and under permissions, you'll go under discovery management. And in here, you'll need to add in this application impersonation uh, role and add in cloud control admin as a member of that. And once that's there, this is for Exchange. Uh, if you want to do um, SharePoint, you can do the same thing. You'll go over to your SharePoint admin site, uh, find your, your uh, site collection, and really all you can do is go into Site Collection Administrators and add the CC admin as an admin under Site Collection Administrators, right? What that's going to end up doing is you'll log into the uh, NetApp uh, dashboard, and once you've provisioned your account, uh, it's really quite simple. You just log in with your admin, your Office 365 admin account. There's no agents to install or anything. Once you've added these permissions, it'll, it'll um, log in and go in and find all of your active users. Um, and so you can see you'll have a list. When you first start, show up with, uh, with Exchange, you'll have a list of unprotected mailboxes. Right? So I just want to jump back to the dashboard because I've got a few of them that are already protected. And so once I go into my protected uh, mailboxes that I'm backing up, you can see there's this concept of a tier one. I have them all listed as tier ones. Out of the box, they have three different tiers, and what that really is is setting up what your RPO is. Um, so tier one means that I'm going to get, that mailbox is going to get backed up every 12 hours. Tier two is backed up every 18 hours, and a tier three is backed up every 24 hours. So it's kind of your restore point of, of you know, if something goes, goes wrong, how quickly can I restore? You can go in here and manually back up somebody anytime you wanted to. So it makes for a great legal hold. If you know you're getting ready to, to release somebody from their employment, you can go and back up their email really quick um, and use it as a legal hold. One of the things I also want to point out with this backup that I think is really interesting, so all of this is backing up to an S3 bucket. Okay? Out of the box, you're going to use, you can use their, and I say their, NetApp's S3 bucket. And it basically gives you unlimited backup, unlimited um, uh, data storage for 365 days. So all these backups, they'll hold the backups for 365 days. You can provision it to use your own S3 account. And from then, so you, you can keep it backed up for as long as you want to, but then you're going to incur the, the storage costs on your S3 bucket. So give or take. You know, if you, if, if you need it longer than, than, uh, than 365 days, then by all means, you're going to want to use your own storage, but un understand that you'll, you'll incur the storage cost from that. Otherwise, you can use NetApps and it's unlimited amount of storage. But what I want to show you as far as restoring that I think is awesome, first is if I highlight a user and I say restore, the default is restore to the same mailbox that it came from. But I can restore it, uh, or uh, export it as a PST, or I can restore it to another location in my Office 365 in, a, in another mailbox. 
Um, and that's what it would look like if I was going to restore the entire mailbox. But what if I wanted to come in and just restore uh, a certain mail, like one particular mail? Um, give it time to come up here. You can see it's pulling up every single email, and I can click and restore that particular email that I want. And yeah, this is my real email, so you're seeing <laughs> Panther tickets. Um, and the same goes for, for, uh, for OneDrive. You know, I can restore an entire OneDrive, or I could go in and restore a particular file from OneDrive that got deleted. So I can drill into my folders that I have in OneDrive and restore any particular file that I may want to from the backup. Um, and SharePoint's the exact same way. I can restore an entire SharePoint site or I can restore a file from that SharePoint site. Um, now what I'll tell you is the backups in, in the testing that I've done with this, and I've got a pretty, I mean, it's my personal email, so I've got a pretty hefty personal email box. I don't ever delete anything, much like most Exchange users. Once I told it to back up, it took about two minutes to back up my entire uh, email box, which I thought was amazing. You know, whenever I did on-prem backups before, to even to disk, it took a long time. Um, so being able to back up and then restore within minutes, uh, to me, is a very, very powerful, compelling, uh, compelling story. Um, just digging in through through the mailbox, you can see the jobs that are running. So this is. All the, um, it says recent running jobs. These are everything that's queued to, to do. You see it's at 0% because they're not firing off yet. And you can see the times that they are going to fire off. Um, and you can also scroll down and see ones that have completed. So if there's ever an error, you can drill, drill down in and see, you know, what the error was, what the problem was. So you can go um, figure out what you need to do. Um, and then just re reporting, here's everything that's happened. Likewise, every, I think, it's either 12 or 24 hours right now, it's going to go back out and scan for new users. So as you add users into Office 365, it'll pick up those new users and report them as unprotected mailboxes or OneDrive users or whatever. Um, yeah. So I wanted to stop there also and see if anybody had any questions here. Nothing, huh? On the size of the bell mailbox? Nope. Nope. As 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 big as the mailboxes that you have in Office 365, they'll back it up. So if you're are if you're using the archive of Office 365, uh, that I haven't played with, so I'm not sure if it'll back up that. I'm I'm assuming it will since it's just a folder underneath that it would back that up as well. Yes, sir. Calendar items and tasks and everything. So the question was, is it only mail? No, it's calendar items, tasks, everything that, that's part of Office 365. So anything you would have in Outlook. When you do a restore, do you say, well, I'm going to go back to it ago? It would just be the latest backup. Um, I guess if you're saying, um, if I restore like an entire mailbox, Yeah. That is a good question, and I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out. No, uh, no. So you do have to. Well, I mean, I think you can from the from a user standpoint, um, but when you go into the services, uh, like if I go into Exchange, you'll see. Actually, let me go into service here. Actually, I'll have to dig in and find it. There is a place where you tell it whether it's going to use um, their storage or your own. And of course, it makes a pricing difference, right? Uh, so out of the box, the, the, the retail pricing for this is $45 per year per user. Um, so, you know, 45 bucks a user to protect their mailbox, protect everything in Office 365. 
is compelling and when you consider that factors in all the storage costs too. But I don't know. I, it, see me afterwards. Let me get your contact information. I'll find out. I think we have some NetApp people here in the room. There, maybe. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, and it's. It, it's, you could probably see it as um, maybe, maybe not, depending on the size of your organization or the nature of your business, whether you've, we're backing up everybody, or if you say, well, I'm going to take care of the CEO, CFO, CIO, you know, your CXO suite, um, and that would be a, a business rule for sure. Right. Right. And, and, and that's where I see this as useful, because Office 365 has a great legal hold and e-discovery as well, but if they've gone through and cleaned out their mailbox a month prior because they knew they were interviewing, you're, you're a little short there then, right? Yes. $45 a year, yeah. Yeah, so it's the whole suite. Um, Nope. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I was kind of I, I was kind of shocked by it too. Yeah. So he was sorry. I'll try to rephrase the question. He was asking if it was just Exchange or if it was OneDrive and SharePoint for the forty-five dollars. And it's yeah, it's it's all of it for for the forty-five dollars. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh, that I don't know. I'll have to find out, but it, you know, it's much less. Because obviously they realize that you're going to incur the storage costs then. And I honestly don't know. <laughs> I've, always, I've always used theirs, so. <laughs> Anybody have any just general Office 365 questions? I can answer those too. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, actually installing Skype on AWS, yes. Yeah, we have a lot of customers that are doing that. Um, I would say uh, behind, so behind SharePoint, in, or not SharePoint, but SQL. SQL is obviously the biggest Microsoft app that, if you want to call it an app, that, that comes over. Um, SharePoint probably tends to be the next biggest one, um, and, and Link and Skype for Business uh, is probably the one right behind that that we get the most requests for. It's just put it on instances. We do have some quick starts, much like the SharePoint quick start I showed you. We do have some, uh, some Skype for Business quick starts that'll build it out. We have some, same thing for Exchange if you wanted to run Exchange on, off, on AWS. There are customers that do it for particular reasons. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It is particularly my number one request <laughs> because I'm the one that get, get that hears that from the customers most. Yes, we are trying to work on it. Um, it's a limitation of, of just the way SharePoint installs and it wants to use the sysadmin role on the, on the SQL server, so trying to get a, around that. It was a similar issue that we had with, with the ADF, ADFS install, and so we just kept working on it hard until we found a way around it with this OU. Um, but yeah, we're going to continue. I know it, it, it comes up all the time. Um, you, you know, we're trying to work with Microsoft to do it. You know, I, I know everybody likes to play Microsoft and AWS as as major competitors, and but there's a lot of areas that we work together. SQL is one of them. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but when they released SQL 2017, we had it available two days afterwards because we had a bunch of our devs in Redmond with the SQL team working with them constantly and giving them feedback. Um, we're a huge SQL user internally, and obviously a big reseller of SQL. Um, and so SQL RDS is, is, is a big one, and we continue to try to work with them. SQL team at Microsoft isn't necessarily responsible for that. It's more of the SharePoint team. 
Um, and obviously, their focus is SharePoint Online. And so I haven't been involved in those conversations, but I'm not sure how motivated they are to help us fix the problem either. Yes, sir. Content that exists in Teams. Um, so, yeah, that's not part of this application yet. Um, the conversations I've had with NetApp that it's definitely on. So they just added um, Office 365 groups that just came online as part of the backup literally like a few weeks ago. Um, and so I'm not sure how far on their dev cycle, their roadmap that Teams is, but I got to imagine it's there because Teams is, is quite popular in Office 365. I haven't seen the numbers, but I assume it's probably one of the fastest growing Office 365 services they have. Uh, since they rolled it out, it's been widely successful. So I'm sure NetApp is working on it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, um, I would highly recommend it. Uh, we do it all the time. Any implementation that I work with on a customer, I kind of walk them down that this is the best way to secure uh, multi-factor authentication. And, and, and you're right, there's one from Microsoft. There's several others available. I personally, don't really care which one you pick. Just pick one, please, because um, there's a lot of people out there not doing it, and it's, it's really not that hard to implement and probably one of the strongest securities for, uh, for um, you know, securing your users going across the Internet like that. Yeah, depending on what tier you sign up for, yes. Yeah, and then there's, so it depends on if you have Azure AD or Azure AD Premium um, and the suite of Office 365 E3 or E5 or E6 or wherever they're at today. Um, but yes, uh, and absolutely, turn it on. You, you should use it. It's, it's quite good. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so your first question, repeat that for me. No, no, no. Yeah, so the, the NetApp is going to get all the users from, from Azure AD um, and Office 365, which kind of go hand in hand, if you haven't already noticed. Um, so I, I hear a lot of people say, well, I have an Office 365 user. I'm like, well, you actually have an Azure AD user that uses Office 365, but let's not split hairs. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, it, it managed AD is not a requirement. Yeah, it's just going to pull it off from, from Azure AD. I believe so. I haven't heard any location requirements, but again, um, I don't want to speak for NetApp. I th thank you. <laughs> and what were, you had one more. I don't, but he would. <laughs> Anything else? Great. Well, if you didn't want to ask a question in front of the whole group, I'll be around for a while. Uh, um, and hopefully, you know, if you guys run into me at replay, we can uh, drink and have a question over a beer. Uh, the questions and answers tend to get more interesting then. So, <laughs> I really appreciate you all coming out. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so you would expose it because you have to give it a public name, just like you, you would. You know, you have to give it a DNS name, publicly routable, so that ADF, so that Azure AD can, can sync to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's funny you refer to it as a farm because you're obviously a bigger enterprise. You have multiple ADFS servers then. Some only have one, so. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's scalable the same way. Yeah. Yep. 
That's right. That's right. The, the, my intention of showing you that wasn't to, you've probably been down the ADFS install and AD sync and all that. It's the exact same. It's just, I was trying to show you the trick with the managed AD. Since you don't have domain admin and, or, or, um, enter, or enterprise admin rights to the box, there's a little bit of a trick to get ADFS to install, but the rest of the install is the exact same. No, it won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, yes, if you're gonna do what I was talking about as far as using managed AD, your users need to sit in managed AD. Yeah. It is, it's, it's a stepping stone for people who are trying to deprovision on-prem. Um, so we're trying to show you Look, you can, and you've been able to do this a long time with running AD on EC2. Um, we were just, we want to make sure people are aware that you can do it with the managed AD as well. Obviously, there's a, uh, it's, it's a long tail for people who are actually going to turn off AD that's on-prem. But we do have newer customers that are starting in the cloud as well, so. Well, and yes, let's have a beer and talk about that. <laughs> there's, there, yes, there's, there's more than one way to skin that cat, but yeah, yeah. Anything else? Well, again, thank you all for coming. I know it's late on Thursday. It's been a long week. I really appreciate you showing up. Um, and again, I'll be here for a little while if you have any other questions you want to ask.